Warm greetings from CNS to this very special webinar, Unite to NTB. As we all know, governments of more than 190 countries have already committed to end tuberculosis by 2030 by adopting the Sustainable Development Goals at the UN General Assembly in September 2015. This commitment to end tuberculosis is in line with the WHO end TB strategy which was adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2014. Today we will learn more on how to accelerate progress to end TB by 2030 or maybe even earlier. Before we begin, let me make a few quick announcements. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while panelists present. No need to wait, just type in your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand you will see on your screen. We will take up these questions during the question and answer session. I also humbly request all panelists to please present in time so that we have good time left for questions and answers. Thanks for your cooperation. Undoubtedly, health and Okay, sorry, sorry. Let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsaru. He's a senior and widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban with more than 43 years of rich experience in journalism. Over to you, Ashok. Namaskar ji, greetings to everybody. Uh, the warm greetings from Durban, South Africa. Not far from Durban, we are dealing with the worst known outbreak of XDR TB, the deadliest strain of tuberculosis. The extensively drug resistant type, meaning that many antibiotics do not work against it. In 2006, researchers there reported an alarming finding 52 out of 53 patients with both HIV and XDR TB had died and half died within a month of getting a diagnosis. Initially, doctors thought most patients had developed XDR-TB because of treatment failure, that they had had regular TB or a slightly drug resistant version. And because they had either not been prescribed the right drugs or had not taken them all, the infections became resistant to multiple drugs. Instead, they found many patients had never been treated, implying that the deadliest strain was being transmitted between people. Now, a new study published in the New England Journal of Medicine by South African and American scientists has shown the problem there is much bigger than previously realized. Undoubtedly, health and non-health sectors both need to collaborate effectively along with other stakeholders, including affected communities to accelerate efforts to end TB by 2030 or earlier. With this intent, potentially one of the most pivotal meetings happening this year is the WHO Global Ministerial Conference, ending TB in this sustainable development era a multi-sectoral response which will be held in Moscow, Russia during 16, 17 November 2017. Well, we're going to welcome our panelists, Dr. Mario Ravi Glioni, Director Global TB Program of the World Health Organization, WHO, Dr. Somia Swaminathan, Director General of Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, and Secretary of Department of Health Research, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Not forgetting Paul Jensen, Director, Policy and Strategy, International Union Against Tuberculosis, Lung Disease, the Union. And not forgetting, once again, Prabha Mahesh, TB survivor, who is advocating for improving TB care and control. Well, let's be welcome. And of course, not forgetting our erstwhile Madam Shobaji. Let me welcome Dr. Mario Ravigalone, 
Filoni, Director, Global TV Program of the World Teller Group. Who? Over to you, Doctor. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Very good. So, um, let me start uh, my presentation. Um, let me just show the screen. Can you see the screen now? I can see the screen here. Perfect. All right. So, let me start my presentation saying that what I want to do is, as was mentioned already by our moderator, is to give you an assessment of the situation uh, regarding the preparation, the preparatory work, and the vision for the uh, Moscow Ministerial Conference that was mentioned. So, uh, as you all know, we have a commitment now globally in writing, in a way, from the World Health Assembly as well as from the um, framework, within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goal, to uh, end tuberculosis, to end the TB epidemic. That is part of the SDG number three, that actually uses the phraseology I mentioned, ending the TB epidemic by 2030, and is obviously the uh, focus of the end TB strategy that was approved and later named end TB strategy by the World Health Assembly in 2014, to start then implementation in 2016. So, um, I want just to present this particular slide that is a complex one and requires a bit of uh, explanation, but is also uh, showing the complexity of tuberculosis itself. So, um, uh, the uh, slide uh, shows essentially all the determinants of tuberculosis and the way tuberculosis develops. And if you go on top and you look at poor living and working condition, that row, you see immediately that there are certain important issues there that determine tuberculosis. Poor living, working condition, food insecurity, unhealthy behavior. And then you go down in the second row, you will find that, that poor living condition means effectively crowding, poor ventilation, indoor air pollution, all factors, risk factors for tuberculosis. Or, if you go further, malnutrition, HIV AIDS, non-communicable diseases such as lung diseases, diabetes particularly, alcohol particularly, smoking and so on. They are all, you know, uh, pathways towards, in a way, tuberculosis. And all of this then translates into a conducive environment for the transmission of TB, going from the exposure of someone to TB to infection, and later, if you continue on the, let's say, the black uh, boxes there, in black writing, you will find that the impaired host defense reduced, therefore, the uh, um, capacity to resist to tuberculosis, and you then go from a latent infection stage towards an active disease and eventually the consequences which include obviously death. And you see around that in the color boxes all the variety of different SDGs that are crucially important for TB. That's why this is a complex slide because it reflects a complex social economic problem. And I cannot go to each one of them, but you can you have time to look into them, but this basically SDG one on poverty, SDG two on uh, nutrition. SDG 11, which is uh, uh, on, on top there in orange for the uh, slum dwellers, etc., etc. So, tells you that the, uh, in a way, the way to face tuberculosis in the modern era has to go beyond the uh, pure and essential, anyway, let's call it biomedical approach of making the diagnosis and treating people. So, we really have to look at it from a, an, a holistic point of view understanding and advocating for solution towards all these other SDGs in order to get also TB under control. Now, uh, just uh, before I go back to Moscow, which is the, uh, the, the consequence of that reasoning, in a way, uh, I want just to, uh, to, to say that World TB Day 2017 uh, will have the slogan of Unite to NTB and particularly Leave No One Behind, which is the general slogan of the SDGs, and uh, it has particular focus on that. It includes particularly uh, emphasis on addressing stigma, discrimination, marginalization, all the vulnerable populations that are affected by TB, based on the slide I was showing you before. It is aligned very much with the SDG uh, framework, and uh, it's part of it, as I mentioned. There is a call to action that wants to ensure access for all, especially the most vulnerable, the most marginalized 
to quality TB care, addressing then MDRTB, which we know is a public health crisis, stigma, discrimination that make the life of poor people affected by TB miserable. And so we want to really fight against those and advocate against those type of sentiments. And of course, then we take advantage of World TB Day to highlight the uh, agenda, in a way, uh, that we have for the Moscow conference. Now, going towards that, this is the title, Ending TB in the Sustainable Development Era, and emphasizing the multi-sectoriality of the response. It will be held in Moscow, as, I, as you see, on 16, 17 November 2017, hosted by the Russian uh, government. The vision is, once again, in response to the complex life I showed you before, that of having a multi-sectoral approach to tuberculosis. Uh, keeping in mind that this is the number one infectious killer in the world today, and keeping in mind that we have ambitious targets set between, uh, uh, set within, rather, the World Health Assembly Resolution and the United Nations SDG. Um, the expected outcome slide showed essentially the eight same uh, thematic areas that we have chosen as priority to address tuberculosis. So all of them have to be seen in a multi-sectoral type of, uh, uh, of approach. Uh, in, uh, in concrete terms, each one of these eight areas will have, in the end, a policy brief, as we call it, which highlights the topic and the potential solutions, the options that are out there to uh, solve these uh, challenges. So, for instance, I go to them very quickly because we don't have enough time, but uh, I'm ready actually to explain anything to whoever has questions. Number one is the universal coverage of TB care and prevention. This is really particularly dear to uh, people, for instance, in uh, implementers or funders, like, say, the Global Fund. They want to really make sure that we emphasize the essentials of TB control that, in the end, means providing access to proper diagnosis and treatment for everyone. The second one is very much in the agenda of the sustainable development, the sustainable financing. We have to realize that tuberculosis is not like malaria, that is 90% in low-income countries of Africa, or HIV, that is 70% in those low-income countries, in a way. TB is a disease of the BRICS and of the middle-income countries as well. And in number terms, is much more, is nearly two-thirds, in fact, is more than two-thirds in those countries. It's only about 25% in low-income countries of Africa and Asia. So here we have a problem because this, uh, uh, these big mechanisms, such as the Global Fund, uh, are making the countries that we are interested in more and more ineligible. And this is the problem we have because you will not face the MDRTB epidemic simply by, uh, 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 by expecting that domestic financing will take over immediately. That's where we have to now focus. The third area is that of equity, ethics, and human rights. We are talking here about the marginalized or the stigmatized population, the migrants in particular, the refugees in particular, the prisoners, and other vulnerable groups. I was talking recently with Japan. For them, is uh, essentially the elderly population, the most vulnerable one. Number four is research. Badly, badly underfunded. There has been a lot of emotion recently about the publication of the list of priority bacteria by WHO. I want to emphasize once again that tuberculosis is the uh, disease that has, uh, you know, a clear pipeline nowadays of what we, pipeline, sorry, I'm using the wrong word, a, a clear understanding of what we need in diagnostics, treatment, and vaccine terms, but we are badly underfunded. It's about one-third of the estimated funding that is available today. Number five is a new way of monitoring that goes along the SDG agenda. Six, seven, and eight are the big other health agendas, the action on the antimicrobial resistance, ensure, ensuring that MDRTB is part of that agenda, and you have seen the consequences of not being integral part of the agenda in the last two or three weeks with the publication of the uh, bacterial list that did not include tuberculosis. We are trying to correct that. Number seven is the TB HIV response, obviously, and number eight is the linkages and the synergies that we must have for the care and the prevention of non-communicable diseases that are so much of an important uh, determining factor for TB. Now, this is quickly the roadmap towards Moscow, and you see there are a bunch of different uh, uh, events, including the steering committee that will make decision on the policy briefs in May during the World Health Assembly. Steering committee is basically the BRICS countries plus Pakistan, Indonesia, and Belarus, with some observers such as US and, gov and the government of Japan. 
Uh, then we will have our stag in June, during which we will discuss the policy briefs in detail. We'll finalize everything. There will be APEC uh, meeting in Vietnam that prioritizes tuberculosis, for example, and other opportunities to ensure that we build the maximum consensus. Then there will be the ministerial conference in Moscow, and the year after, in 2018, the crucially important UN General Assembly. Let me go for a moment on this uh, uh, last slide uh, to the UN General Assembly, uh, a high-level meeting scheduled in 2018, still a, num a date to be defined, uh, on tuberculosis. This is a major achievement by the TB community. In 2017, Ministerial Mos uh, Conference in Moscow. In 2018, UN General Assembly. So it, you see what it means. It means that we will be also as WHO, in a way, central to this preparatory work because we will have to prepare the scope and modalities and the options and modalities, as the resolution says, for the conduct of such a meeting. And we will do that in connection with, obviously, the member states that are the ones in, a, in the end driving this, this agenda and in connection with the civil society through a mechanism that uh, we will uh, uh, establish very soon and we are in, in discussion with many uh, partners on how to ensure that everyone, non-governmental organization, faith-based organization, you know, civil society, community organizations, corporate sector and so on, have a role, academics, have a role to play towards this UN General Assembly. We have an opportunity in 2018 to bring tuberculosis at the highest possible level of the heads of state. If we do it well, if we do it in September of 2018, which is the assembly that normally puts around the table the heads of state. We have an opportunity that is unprecedented, and I really hope that everyone participates and contributes to this one, because that would be probably a milestone in the future control of TB. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mario Raviglioni, Director, Global TB Program of the World Health Organization, WHO. Well, this is a perfect stage set to, well, to call upon Dr. Somaya Swaminathan, Director General of Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, and Secretary of Department of Health Research, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. It's now over to you, Doctor. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Loud and clear. Okay, excellent. So I want to uh, continue from where Mario left off, uh, especially focusing on R&D needs for TB. And Particularly, I would like to highlight the role of India and other BRICS countries in this, what progress has been made and what more needs to be done. But TB is one disease, though it's such an old disease and we've, you know, had it ever since probably from the beginning of mankind and we've also had knowledge about the causative organism for the last 130 odd years. We've had a, you know, Robert Koch basically designed the diagnostic test, which was the microscopic examination for AFB. And a BCG vaccine was developed in the early 1920s. It's been used uh, all over the world. More than 5 billion or so doses have been given to people. And um, the drugs for TB have also been available now for at least 50 years or more. And yet, there's a lot we still don't understand about both the bacteria as well as the host response to it and about better ways of uh, prevention of transmission and prevention of progression from infection to disease. So if you take diagnostics, for example, we still, most of the world is using smear microscopy. There is, of course, for the last couple of years, a lot of progress in molecular diagnostics, both for diagnosis of TB and drug resistance, but they're expensive. They're made by a couple of companies, and we're still in a situation where a large proportion of patients don't have access to this, particularly access to uh, upfront resistance testing. So I think we need a lot more research urgently to develop point-of-care diagnostics, which are rugged, efficient, usable in primary health settings, can operate at different temperatures by a not a very highly trained uh, technician and so on. 
we also need biomarkers for predicting who's going to progress. So we know that only one out of every 10 people who get infected actually progress to disease. But at this point of time, neither the tuberculin skin test nor the IGRA test actually help predict who that one out of 10 is. And so if you have to give preventive therapy, you have to give it to all 10. That's not a very efficient use of uh, resources. And it's also not optimal in the sense you're asking a lot of people to take therapy for something they're not really at risk of progressing. So if you could have a biomarker test, and again, there's been a lot of work recently on looking at gene signatures in whole blood and in the neutrophil uh, component of the blood and so on, but we, we yet don't have that perfect test to predict progression. And a third area in this is related to radiography and how can we expand the use of uh, particularly digital radiography and, and, and use uh, modern technology, IT, to be able to read large numbers of x-rays using computer-aided algorithms and so on in order to save uh, the time of you know, actual radiologists and human beings. In the area of, of uh, treatment, we, uh, it would be nice to have a universal regimen for TB. That is to say that you could treat everybody regardless of drug resistance to the currently used drug groups. And that's now feasible because of the new classes of drugs that have been developed in the last couple of years, including bedaquilin and delaminate, but also with a few more coming along in the pipeline. So there's a need for a lot more clinical trials of new drug combinations. There's a need to test adjunct therapies for TB, um, what, what are called host-directed therapies, whether it's metformin or whether it's a leukotriene inhibitor, uh, leukotriene synthase inhibitor, whether it's a drug efflux pump inhibitor, or whether it's a micronutrient like vitamin D. Unless we do the trials, we're not going to know whether these are useful as add-on or adjunct treatments. And then in the area of vaccines, we uh, obviously need a vaccine that is more effective than BCG in preventing the adult, adult forms of TB. Now, these are all, you know, more in the research is needed in the area of early development as well as translational, taking the leads forward through all the stages of testing, preclinical testing, animal testing, human testing, till we actually have a product on the shelf um, that needs both human resources and financial resources. But we also have another spectrum of research, which is at the end of the operational implementation research, which is actually working in programs using, trying to optimize the tools that we already have, trying to optimize service delivery, looking at health systems, looking at how best care can be delivered in different settings, you know, we're very different in an urban slum, very different in a remote mountainous area uh, where you have a low population density. So that's implementation research. It's very, very important and it's, it teaches you lessons immediately which are applicable to the program. So we, in India, for example, now we've created something called the India National TB Research Consortium or cons uh, uh, Research Foundation which is trying to bring together stakeholders uh, from the private sector, public sector, you know, pharma, industry, startups, entrepreneurs, scientists, and funding agencies to see if we can actually deliver some of these products uh, within a defined time frame within the next five to ten years if we work on a mission mode. And the BRICS countries health ministers met in, in New Delhi um, about two months ago and all reaffirmed their commitment that TB was one of their top priorities and especially in the area of research and development the BRICS countries have all agreed to cooperate. Um, similarly we just completed a Southeast Asian regional ministers meeting yesterday in New Delhi where all the 11 health ministers uh, from the 11 Southeast Asia countries had come and uh, a sort of unprecedented political commitment uh, to ending TB in this region, but again, a commitment also to set up some kind of an innovation fund that would help move research in this, in this area. 
So I think I would uh, just leave it at that to say that as we think about elimination of TB or ending TB, we cannot ignore the, the research component because as now, as of now, we do not have all the tools that are needed to drive down TB to the rates where we want to go. So we, whatever we do with existing tools can only take us thus far. Without new tools, we will not be able to reach the elimination targets. And so we really need to, to spread that message far and wide and to come together. Like I said, it's not only the financial resources that are needed, but also a commitment and a coming together of scientists to try and solve some of these, these, these scientific challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samia Swami Nathan. But before we get to the next speaker, we cross to mm. Madam Shoba. Madam Shoba, okay. can you hear me? We can proceed to the next speaker, Ashok. Okay, great stuff. Okay, uh, moving on. Let us listen to Paul Jensen, Director of Policy and Strategy at the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, or the Union. Paul was part of a team earlier that was instrumental in developing and, exe and executing global advocacy strategies that mobilized more than $1 billion US dollars in new, rec in new resources for TB HIV, AIDS, and other development priorities. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Ashok. Um, so the, the key message that I want to communicate in advance of this World TB Day is our need to accelerate progress against TB. This is something that we need to do urgently. We urgently need to speed up progress. And to do that, I want to repeat something that Ashok said at the beginning and that Mario said at the top of the call, which is that we need the involvement of many more people around the world. I think it's important to remember that TB kills more people than any other infectious disease in the world, and yet it's curable. So how is it that an infectious disease that kills the most people in the world is curable? And there are many reasons for that, but on the one hand, the reason is really simple not enough people know about the disease in order to make it a social priority. So we need a lot more people to know about the disease. We need a lot more people to care about TB, and that's how we'll see more action to end TB and to, and to reach these important targets that have been mentioned. Another point I want to emphasize is that uh, the world is also facing a crisis caused by drug resistance. And drug-resistant TB, at this when we talk about drug-resistant TB, this is 580,000 people annually um, that WHO estimates uh, that suffer from drug-resistant TB each year. Now, on the individual level, the community level, this is one of the worst illnesses that a person can ever face. And even when people survive drug-resistant TB, when, when you talk to them, you know, they say that the disease has, has changed their life forever. This is a life-altering illness for, for many people, not only physically and emotionally, but also financially. Socially, it, it impacts every area of, of one's life. And yet, when we look at, at drug-resistant TB, four out of five people who become sick with it are not even diagnosed. And so these people, they stay sick, they die, the disease continues to spread. So, so what is the solution? Funding and resources are absolutely critical. And, and the following is something that, that's really timely. So yesterday, the President of the United States issued a, a draft budget document for the federal government in the United States. The, the United States is one of the, the key uh, investors and, and funders and donors for Global TB. And if this document were to be enacted in its current form, uh, it, it could potentially see very large cuts to TB programs around the world that are funded through, through USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development. The budget proposes a 28%, that's 28% uh, cut 
in foreign aid and diplomacy. And USAID is the agency with primary responsibility for U.S. foreign assistance that goes to fight tuberculosis. And so we need to work with the administration to make public health a much bigger priority and responding to TB a, a much bigger priority. And we've already seen signs that the administration could potentially be placing value on, on having strong public health. We saw a few weeks ago uh, President Trump, he issued an executive order that would uh, place a freeze. Um, so it would place a freeze on hiring of federal government employees, but public health was exempted from the freeze. And if you look at the budget document, it maintains funding for the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. And it maintains uh, funding to reach current commitments through PEPFAR, the U.S. Global AIDS Program, as well as for malaria. So all of these are good things. And so at this point, um, I want to be optimistic that we can make a compelling case for fighting TB. Now, the, the U.S. The presidential administration is not the only decider on, on what gets funded. The United States Congress will also have a really important role to play, and TB advocates are urging Congress to provide $400 million in the next fiscal year for fighting TB, which is really just a very small fraction of the overall budget. Um, so the last thing I want to share in terms of a solution also regards drug-resistant TB. So last year, uh, the World Health Organization recommended a implementation of a, of a new treatment regimen for drug-resistant TB. And implementing that regimen is something that every country can do to help end TB. This is a, a treatment approach that uh, is shorter than the previous approach. It, it reduces treatment from about two years down to nine months. And it's also more effective and cheaper than the previous regimen. And so the next step now needs to be countries need to, to unroll this treatment and, and see it implemented. And if they did that, that, that would have an impact. Um, also, I wanted to pick up on something that, that uh, Dr. Uh, Sumia just mentioned, too, regarding the use of new tools. The union is involved in, in a new initiative to find an even shorter and better treatment regimen for TB um, called 3P. And the goal of that initiative is to find a treatment that works for all forms of TB, both drug susceptible and drug resistant. And the treatment length, the goal uh, is to find a treatment length um, that is one month or less for all of TB. So, so this is something that if it were successful, would really revolutionize the approach to TB globally. And seeing that success happen is going to depend on um, mobilization of resources and contribution of, of resources from governments and, and other uh, um, funding areas. So we have no time to lose. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was Paul Jensen, Director of Policy and Strategy at the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, or the Union. Well, we have saved the best for the last. The voice from the front lines. Prabha Mahesh, a TB survivor who champions the cause of genuine engagement of affected communities in TB responses, is also a TB ambassador with the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease in Mumbai. It's over to you, Prabha. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my heart, heartiest uh, thanks uh, to the platform for having given me this opportunity. Uh, in the opening, let me just say, because uh, at every forum, as a TB advocate, I keep saying that uh, there has to be a strong representation of TB patients in such uh, forums especially in policy making and planning and uh, if it is for the TB patients and TB patients have to be a part of it and uh, I'm very thankful to CNS for respecting that sentiment and giving this opportunity and uh, it's indeed a proud moment for me to part, be a part of this panel. Mm, at the onset uh, all of us are aware 
painful journey of tuberculosis, we know that TB being a communicable disease, it is much beyond a physical dimension of any particular disease. There's much more to it in terms of social, psychological. It has a different kind of a dimension, uh, unlike any other disease. And the most important ingredient for any disease control program is to be successful. What is very important is early detection, timely treatment, accurate treatment regimen, treatment adherence, and prevention of the disease. I think all of you are understood what I'm talking about. And at each stage, right from early detection till the adherence and even till even uh, in terms of prevention, I think at every step the, it's been a huge challenge as far as tuberculosis control has been. And at the, when we're talking about uh, TB, there are so many dimensions and determinants to it. If you look at the socio-cultural determinants, especially the beliefs uh, about the disease. Even now, we have been talking about it for ages together and today we are also talking, uh, we are talking of elimination, but there are still places where I have worked in the remote areas and slum communities. There are population who still carry a lot of misconceptions and even among the educated lot, the middle income groups, they, they have an inadequate science-based knowledge this is very true even in terms of patients who are qualified. Believe me, when I had uh, suffered from TB, I had, uh, I'm a postgraduate and I had uh, good uh, uh, knowledge about disease, but definitely when it came to TB, it was very difficult for me to accept the disease. So what plays the psychosocial factors that basically contri uh, contribute and it hinders treatment adherence what I have seen not only in the patients and also as a personal experience, right from the acceptance of the disease, there is always a feeling of helplessness and uh, a patient, patients generally they tend to feel incapacitated. They suffer from mood swings and anxiety and uh, of course a lot of you are aware of the stigma and discrimination. So my very question is that we have been conducting so many awareness programs and we've been bombarding community and at each level we have had the levels of advocacy. But still, why is this uh, stigma and discrimination still present? Uh, I, I, I'm sure, I know there will be a day where we can talk about TB elimination, but I'm still having my own doubts when it comes to stigma and discrimination. Now the major barrier what we are seeing in treatment adherence and all of us are aware at any given time we are seeing percentages of MDR population on the rise and uh, all of us are aware of the major barriers of this treatment adherence apart from the other physical factors or the causal factors. We are looking at migration and the general features, uh, the other geographical features. But there are also inconsistent and partial treatment of the disease which is still very much in existence. And the patient's perception about the disease is usually stained and the patient permanently hold negative feelings towards this disease. Now, in terms of uh, creating awareness, like I think the most important ingredient is community intervention. There was a time when we started off with the ACSM. We said advocacy, communication and social mobilization. I think this really needs a very strong boost especially in terms of community intervention. Let me share my experience. When I have been working for more than a decade with the TB patients, what I have seen is that most important part that is being missed even from the private providers, the kind of technical knowledge or the medical knowledge which is very much available does not really help the patient at that moment of time. But what is most important, even in patient counseling, it's just not communicating, just communicating to the patient or educating about the disease, but giving, uh, helping the patient or developing the kind of coping capacity to the patient as to how the person can overcome the disease in terms of the most important tool, at least what we have developed in the field setting is that what I have uh, experienced along uh, with my team is we have this tool where we actually observe the patient 
and we try and understand the potential reasons for which this patient will default. Once we prepare a checklist of the reasons, these are the potential reasons where the patient would default. The intervention, intervention with that patient is, uh, it becomes very helpful because we can then and there identify the factors why this patient will not continue treatment and work on those lines so that we can stop or avoid interruption. So what I, uh, uh, my personal uh, uh, suggestion is that a lot has to go into the counseling component and the importance of community intervention. I just wonder, that we are talking about funds, we are talking about resources, we are talking about research, we are talking about uh, advancement in medical sciences. Uh, this uh, this dimension or this community intervention, I'm still having uh, my own. Uh, uh, sometimes it's a huge concern as to how much this has been taught and how much of capacity building is done. Now we are talking about multidisciplinary team. You know, it's just not the medical team, and it's just not the. Uh, it is it is like much much beyond the kind of uh, uh, service that is required for the patient is much beyond medicine and maybe diagnosis and treatment and that uh, I mean now it's the time to address these issues so we are in the we are uh, also working on involving the family and the community so that we make them responsible for treatment adherence we have the latest tech we may have the latest technology but we uh, we may send messages we can send calls we can follow up but I think nothing can supplement the human intervention so my take on this is that what is very important is to mobilize community and also we need more and more of advocates, community empowerment, patients network. Like today we are talking about HIV in terms of like they have such support groups and they have gone much, much beyond. So where is when will this happen in the TV world? Representation of patient at all levels, local level, district, national and international level. And also, uh, the, the patient themselves have the power to influence decision makers, also to make advocacy efforts. I think all this can really contribute in a big way to bring the change that we are waiting for. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Prabha Mahesh. Well, all power to you, Prabha Mahesh. Well, it's good time to open the door for Q&A. Participants, please keep sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Well, let's begin the Q&A session. It's over to Madam Shobaji, Citizen News Service Managing Editor. Uh, thank you, Ashok. We have a lot many questions pouring in. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Sood wants to ask a question. Dr. Sood, would you like to ask yourself? There's a question for Mario. Would Dr. Sood like to ask? Or, uh, okay, he has sent the question, so I will ask. Uh, he says that eight thematic areas for the Moscow conference do not include human resources for ending tuberculosis. Does this aspect not need more emphasis? Dr. Mario, would you like to answer that? Yeah, a crucially important question, in fact. We did not include it because it's part of uh, already uh, the strategy, the NTB strategy. What we focused on in Moscow was more like the multi-sectoriality uh, um, that is necessary to face a problem like tuberculosis. But when we say uh, universal coverage of TB care and prevention, and if you look at what it means, it, we, we have a sort of uh, headline that says systems reforms, that includes human resources, full uptake of innovative tools, optimize quality of integrated people-centered care and prevention, that means human resources, and ensure access so that no one is left behind. So it's part of that particular topic, it's part of that particular theme. The same will be valid, for instance, for the point number six uh, as an example action on AMR, including multidrug resistant TB. So within that, we are preparing now a policy brief that really looks into the issue of the 
uh, response to MDRTB, which is not just in fact, it's not just it's based essentially on availability of modern molecular diagnostics and of the drugs that are necessary, as well as the health services that have to be trained properly. Right? You have to have people that are properly trained to deal with a complex, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, disease such as multidrug resistant TB. So, in a way, human resources are everywhere, and uh, that is the point. And so, this is not a budget. Or is not a, uh, is a plan, uh, is more of a um, of topics that require immediate and urgent uh, response. Thank you, Mario. Uh, we have a question from Swapna Majumdar, a senior journalist from India, uh, for Dr. Soumya Swaminathan. She wants to know if there has been some study on the gendered pattern of tuberculosis. If yes, what have been the findings? And if no study has been done to see how TB impacts women differently, don't you think it is necessary to do one to impact policies and programs for TB elimination? Yes, thank you for that question. There was a, a study done, in fact, it was a multi-country study. It was done about eight or ten years ago. And uh, Bangladesh and India were there, included from the Asian region, and it was Peru and one more country I don't remember now and uh, those uh, publications would be available it was led by scientists from the Swiss School of Tropical Medicine they uh, had a number of observations on the gendered uh, aspects of TB including looking at stigma and discrimination and so on and uh, it's certainly true that uh, not a lot has been done in terms of incorporating those uh, findings into you know care delivery or into national TB programs and just last week uh, there was uh, around World TB Day a discussion on uh, on this very topic which was led by an NGO called REACH where there was a book released uh, about stories of nine women survivors with TB women from different social strata and also women with MDR and uh, drug sensitive TB and uh, it has been decided, uh, a note has been sent to the Central TB Division to incorporate um, a section on gender in TB in the National Strategic Plan that's just being finalized at this, at this time. But I think, uh, uh, to come back to the question, there is a need for more research in this area and there's also need for more practical applications you know, at the field level to address the needs of women with TB which are both the biological in terms of genital urinary TB being a specific problem that affects women and causes infertility and other problems, but also in terms of uh, their other uh, social, economic and emotional needs. Thank you, Soumya. And with you at the helm of affairs, we do expect something positive to come out of it. And I just wanted to share that CNS has also compiled personal stories of women with TB and also of transgenders with TB and we will share that document uh, with the participants. Uh, okay. the, our next question is from Philip, Philip Jackpot of Ghana uh, for Paul. Uh, Philip wants to know how much additional money will it take to ensure that the nine months short TB treatment regimen for MDR TB patients reaches everyone. You got to regret it. That is a, that is an excellent question, and as far as I know, Mario, you might want to correct me if if I'm wrong on this, but I I don't believe that any global or full scale costing scenario has been done. Um, but it would be a useful exercise. I could be I could be wrong. I won't be corrected, but that's. Just what I know. And that letter went to. I'm, una okay. I'm unaware of any no. copy answers like so, that. So it was actually regretted, it was not approved. Okay. No, it was initially approved now, uh, and everything was completely... There is some and noise around, maybe people have to be, to be muting themselves. And what a letter for approving it? Yes. You know, I just we wanted, have... I wanted yes. to add to this one, if I can, uh, yes. uh, that yes. in fact, I believe the new global plan, there used to be a specific estimate of the cost of the response to MDRTB in the previous global plan up to 2015, 
I believe the new global plan decided to integrate that component. So we don't have, as a matter of fact, we don't have an estimate at global level. But I would say that more importantly, uh, <clears throat> in this kind of situation, is to try to understand how much it will cost to the individual countries to implement whatever new regimen or old regimen or, 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 or you know, uh, anything that can be done. Because this is really what, what, is, uh, what is required in the end, right? Countries have different, uh, the cost of drugs themselves, right? The price, I should say, of, of drugs themselves uh, varies very much country by country. And so when you do global estimates, you come up with a number that says, oh, we need a billion dollar to do this, that, and the other. But it has little meaning when you have to plan it. And so it's, uh, in a way, more important to understand that. And the national strategic plans for TB normally include estimates that are, you know, precise about how much extra money is necessary for, I don't know what, implementation of expert or implementation of the shorter regimen. Thank you. Uh, Mario, you have another question from Rehan Khan, a journalist from India. Uh, he, Rehan wants to know, will the Moscow conference explore possibilities on how the Ministry of Health will collaborate with each of the nodal ministries for the different SDGs. Because there are so many factors and so many departments involved in this fight against tuberculosis. Yeah, uh, okay, that's a, a, a very valid question again. Um, I, I, the, the purpose of the, um, of the uh, Moscow conference um, uh, has to be seen in the context uh, of uh, the, uh, a trajectory that goes from Moscow to, towards the UN General Assembly. Now, in Moscow, uh, since this is the World Health Organization Ministerial Conference, we have necessarily to deal, uh, we must deal with Ministers of Health and get full information awareness to them. But conscious, very much conscious, that in the majority of cases, Ministers of Health vast majority of cases probably have very little influence in a way on the budgetary allocations from the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance, then <clears throat> we um, are already uh, thinking, in fact we are inviting, we are actually uh, now finding out country by country who would be the additional minister or ministers that could be invited to Moscow. So uh, some countries are already communicating to us. In some cases, is Minister of Social Welfare. In some other cases, is uh, we, we hear that there might be a Deputy Prime Minister also that comes. Uh, in some other, it could be Minister of Justice, because we have the major problem of particularly uh, in the former Soviet Union, for instance, of prisoners. So here we will invite Ministers of Health. That is the number one. But at the same time, we are making clear to all countries that we welcome the participation of other ministers. And we have. Uh, made uh, a provision to pay for the top 40 countries in terms of tuberculosis burden, two people, two people that would be the Minister of Health and a second person that could be a second minister. And then we expect these countries also, if they need, obviously, as they will, the Director of Communicable Diseases or the National Program Managers to cover the expenses for those other people. Because we, we, have, we have a limited budget in a way, so we can pay for 40 countries, two, two per delegation. But as I said, we are uh, dealing specifically with that question. Now, the next step will be obviously the UN General Assembly. And that's where, in a way, any decision that is concrete in Moscow, let's say that there is a decision to establish a new research innov innovation fund, I think uh, 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 Sumia, uh, Sumia mentioned that, um, then we will need potentially to have the consensus that goes well beyond and above the ministers of health. And so we will need the Minister of Technology, of course, but more than that, even the Minister of Finance and the Prime Ministers. And that's where the UNGA, UN General Assembly, high-level meeting on TV, should act. Because that is the, 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 the event that actually puts together the uh, highest levels in the country. So we have to see these two events uh, in the same trajectory towards, in fact, building the maximum level of commitment to finance what needs to be financed. Thank you, Mario. Uh, I just uh, just uh, query any special reason for having chosen Moscow for this conference. Um, yes. Okay. I, I explain. When uh, in 2000 uh, we had the beginning of the Millennium Development Goal era, the Dutch government came up and said we would like very much to uh, host a conference on tuberculosis in the MDG era, in a way. So 15 years later, the Dutch again consulted with us because they wanted to do the same type of meeting 
in uh, the beginning at the beginning of the SDG sustainable development goal era however months later they came back and said they couldn't afford to do it because they were already having the presidency of the European Union and other events then we consulted also with Australia because we knew there was an intention to do an Asia Pacific ministerial conference but again that fell apart because simply the Minister of Foreign Affairs responded that after one month to, 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 to the query you know way saying we cannot do it. The Russians came up to us and said we are very interested in hosting a major conference on TV because we have a major problem of MDR TV and we want also to uh, take a leadership in the world which was very well taken by us because I much prefer honestly to have a conference in a high burden country especially a high MDR TV burden country than to have it in frankly uh, in, in, a, in, a, in any European country or other rich country you know because it's a recognition that they are uh, uh, acknowledging the, 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 the problem and that they are taking measures to make it as visible as possible so that then potentially financial resources and uh, commitment will go towards tuberculosis. And so they came to us and they offered in fact to pay for this conference. They gave us a budget that is in the range of 1.7 million dollars to organize it to pay essentially for these um, country delegations to host uh, them in Moscow and to pay also for the two or three staff that are full time now in preparation of this conference with us, some on policy issues and some on communication issues. So that's why uh, uh, we are held it, uh, holding it in, uh, in, in Moscow and uh, the Russians of course are enthusiastic about that and I can tell you one thing more that a couple of weeks ago we were asked to modify the agenda that was supposed to start at 10 o'clock in the morning to make it at 11 o'clock because of security uh, reasons uh, since uh, the president uh, of Russia, Mr. Putin, will come and open the conference himself. So that tells me there is commitment. Thank, thank you, Mario. Uh, we have a question uh, from uh, Ruxana of the Tribune paper from Pakistan, and the question is for Somia. Uh, Ruxana wants to know yeah. where should our governments put in the limited money they have now in ensuring latest diagnostics? like the gene expert are used upfront at the time of TB diagnosis. And also as uh, Samia you had mentioned that we need new tools. So what needs to be done for doing more R&D R &D for newer tools? What was your first part of the question uh, Shobha? That what should the government do to do what? Uh, to how can they put, make use of the limited resources to ensure that latest diagnostics are used upfront for TB diagnosis? Right. So, first thing I have to clarify is that the resources would need to be increased. So, if you are trying to do everything with the resources available today, then we can't. So, there is no question of uh, scaling up molecular diagnostics and all that with the current uh, resources. So, definitely I think government is committed to doing that. And so, uh, we, are, we are currently evaluating an indigenous molecular diagnostic test which is portable and which is uh, battery operated uh, to see whether it's as good as the currently accepted gold standard which is a gene expert and if it turns out to be as efficient uh, we would then recommend placing it at every primary health center or community health center in order to provide this type of point of care molecular diagnostic. It would also provide drug resistance uh, to rifampicin. So, I think that is a feasible thing, it can happen within the next year or two and uh, again of course it depends on the availability of resources but like I said uh, the government is committed and I think we are moving in that direction. Not only that the government is also committed to providing free diagnosis to everybody uh, including in the, those who are seeking care in the private sector. So free drugs and diagnostics for all TB patients regardless of where they are seeking care. Okay, thank you. And so I have one more question. One uh, journalist wants to know if ethical clearance is required for implementation research. Yes, definitely. Any kind of research involving human beings, uh, uh, it uh, needs ethical clearance and approval, even if it's just a questionnaire, whatever it is, you do need to get ethical approval. Thank you. We have a question from Venkatesh. Uh, would Venkatesh like to ask uh, the question himself? Uh, Venkatesh, we are waiting for you. 
he has raised uh, the virtual hand. Since I may not have an opportunity to meet you again, or uh, I mean, it is a pleasure to meet you. I just wanted to seek your guidance. I'm a young researcher in this thing, trying to uh, like seek funding for uh, projects which are done basically by a not for profit organization, which is accepted as a research organization. Uh, where do we think? Sitaram Bhatia has got DSI. Yes. Uh, I think we are running short of time. We have already exceeded the time for this webinar and several questions are still streaming in uh, for, uh, uh, for the panelists. Sincere apologies as we will not be able to take up every question, but we do promise to share all the questions with the panelists as well as participants. Uh, thanks a lot for your understanding. And thank you, panelists and participants, for a very lively and meaningful webinar uh, this evening. As always, the recording of the webinar will be made available very soon to all of you. Have a good day.